all right guys what's good welcome back it is time we are here i i've got to tell you i have never been so hyped for the worlds i get hyped i'm one of the biggest hype guys there is i get so excited about watching these guys at the highest level to break down the game and really see like what they're doing to innovate and how they're working at it this is the highest level of league of legends that has been played this tournament has shown a lot of promise as far as the team showing off true greatness so i'm super pumped and that's without even talking about the storylines i'm gonna get into three reasons why FlyQuest should actually be really happy with this draw that this is the best time to face gen g i'll do a full video on it later to to release on saturday night make sure you stay tuned to the channel for for that but there's three big things that gen g have going for them when we look at this draw Sorry, that FlyQuest has going up against Gen.G. One, they're playing great. They are playing at such a high level that they are able to metagame and work around their opponents. You saw that they downloaded Team Liquid. They just said, we're just going to slightly outscale you, pick an item breakpoint, watch you come into us and make a hasty decision on a fight. And that's our win condition. And we're going to execute the same plan against you multiple times. Inspired is playing at an incredible level where he's able to think about these things and diagnose at that level. So can you find Gen G's weakness? Well, all of Gen G's games have been played weeks ago, right? At this point, that's the second big thing. Gen G's on a two week honeymoon. They haven't had to play a competitive game. Whereas FlyQuest has had all of this experience on stage, multiple knockout games to try to play. They even got games and looked very close again against HLE who did win, let's not forget the Korean championship. This team is built with two rookie of the years in bot lane that are ready to play in a bot lane supportive meta where you have the Jin and the ash coming out in multiple games where this means that that bot lane can just adapt you can ask masu and and busio to adapt to the team's needs and that's perfect for them because they're young you don't want to have them to have this huge expectation where they have to be the source of the carry they can adapt to the team now those are the two most recent rookie of the years another rookie of the year was inspired and inspired is the transcontinental mvp this guy has won everywhere he has played he's been mvp he's been first team all pro this guy is playing the game at an incredible level and then you have Whippo, who's a perennial all pro, who also has world's finals experience. All right, he's been there, he's seen it. You should hear this team during their shot calls. It's cool, calm, collected, words like walk it in. If nothing ha happens here, we win. All right, let's keep on moving forward. Let's aim for this. Let's stone this player. It's very clear, it's concise, it's going to help the young players, especially. And as much as I've touted up the bot lane, the jungle, and the top, they say their best player is their mid laner. Quad is playing at an incredible level and their team says, let's funnel resources into him. And that's perfect because we have a mid lane carry metagame. All right, we're looking at champions that haven't even been pushed to their limit yet right now as far as pick ban. Akali Silas getting buffs right before Worlds. We've seen them each a little bit. Silas, not only is it blind pickable for strength, but it also goes into all of the ultimates that have been played around the tournament, especially someone like Aurora. Aurora is this champion that is considered blue B1, have to pick it right off the bat. Well, what if you pick Silas, right? Or what if you take the, a champion that says, okay, I dare you to pick Aurora. I'm going to have access to the ult, and then we can try to bully you in lane phase or something like this, right? There's a lot of permutations of draft that could, flavor fly, that could favor FlyQuest, and for these reasons, I'm actually really excited about their game. And I think this is the best chance that NA has had against an Eastern team since Cloud9 back against Afrika. And if you guys remember, we called that and we won. So I'm not saying, I'm just saying, all right? Like FlyQuest is primed to do well. I'm going to do a full video on it to break down all of the elements. The other teams though, like I'm that pumped about FlyQuest every single other team has a world champion on their roster we have weibo coming back from being defeated last year in the finals so they have tons of experience they've swapped junglers with the team that they're playing against today lng who has not lost in two months right it's been several months since they have lost games that mattered then you have hle and blg uh i've 
Billy Billy, it's been kind of surprising how weak they've looked. They might be guilty of skipping ahead, thinking, hey, we're so good, we're, we've been training for the finals. You could see it. We called it way back in March when they played in their in their rematch games where they were flashing T1 emotes in the beginning of the spring season, saying, like, we see you. We're coming. We're coming back for the world championship. So maybe they have been skipping some steps about let's just – do the best we can right now but that team is scary good knight is maybe the best player that has never won a champion yep that includes chovy no knight has won as much or more than chovy has then you have chovy and the rest of gen g how can you how can you vote against this team like as eager as i am to support FlyQuest, gen g has maybe the best bot lane and jungler and mid lane in the tournament and their top lane's no slouch he's been playing great too so where's the weakness here you know it's going to be tough. And then T1, you obviously can get hyped. And then Top Esports, they have three world champions on their roster, right? And they have an insane amount of clout. So there is so there are so many storylines to follow in this, in this tournament, which leads me to my last bonus reason why FlyQuest could be uh, pretty happy that with this draw. The fact that they are the last game that they play on Sunday. All of this eye candy up and around the other seven teams, right? Gen G is going to want to watch this game. They're going to want to see this and really care about the teams and be diagnosing, right? By all means, I think these players should watch the game, but it's a little bit different when Gen G is thinking, I have to watch this game because I want to figure out how to beat T1 or Top Esports. Whereas FlyQuest is like, okay, let me watch this game but I'm still thinking about the monster that's in the room. We have to beat Gen G. So all of this eye candy, all of this distraction, two weeks off, all of the things are pointing to the best possible situation that FlyQuest could have going into this game against Gen G. If they get stomped, then that will just be a narrative that proves to the, to the West that we got to change the way we do things. But I'm excited. I think I think FlyQuest has a legitimate chance, and I'll say it. I think they can win this. I think there's a good chance that they go to five games, and by five games, Gen G just buckles down and absolutely stomps them and says, "No, no, no." All right, we're gonna thank you for reminding us to bring our focus. So I'm calling Gen G winning three two, but it would not surprise me if FlyQuest were able to steal this series, and I'm here for it, man. So those are the stories that I'm looking at going into the game. We see this draft where we see a lot of what we saw in the Swiss rounds. Oriana Skarner played as a combo. We've got Nocturne. Now, something that's coming up interesting in, uh, in this draft from LNG is they've put Nocturne and Renekton together, which means that NAR should have a really easy time up here building an early plated steel caps and, and perhaps building with enough armor items the ability to carry this game. We'll see how that goes. It may be very hard for LNG to break through Breathe on the top side. And then they've got Oriana Rakan to help him out, right? They've got all of these abilities. What I'm looking for from Weibo is a shield bash comp, all right? This is, we call this a shield bash comp because you have multiple sources of shields on your team, plus a champion who can tank, who wears the shield bash already, okay? And this is vital. It's vital to be aware of this because we saw it in FlyQuest versus Team Liquid. Come to us. Come on, you know, here's the fight. Hey, look, now it's time. Like, you don't realize that my team it hasn't shown after buying their items. You haven't seen that they're all on their spikes. Come get me. Hey, look, I'm overstepping. And then Umti, every single time, would ca come jump on Inspired. And Inspired on his Skarner, for example, would just mash shields, uh, protected by two supports on his team, and basically be invincible. If we can get a similar similar sort of fight from this, you see Ash supported from long range, that will allow Rakan to get into the game. And and then that makes it so that really Nar can be that carry. You can look for that big AoE team fight. It's it's going to be interesting. There aren't really split pushers. You can say Nar and Ari, you know, they're they're gonna be okay. Renekton's not gonna wanna stay in a long lane uh, against Nar for sure, and Oriana absolutely absolutely not. 
That will be the window that LNG is looking to go through. They want to get Nocturne to punish the side lane champions. We have a lot of gap close and stun potential from the other solo laners. So when we're looking at Ari plus Renekton, a lot of the, they have a lot of setup potential. Jin has follow-up setup potential, and that's more than enough time for Nocturne to get into the game. <sighs> man, and like now getting into, that's without even talking about the players, man. Scout... If you remember, Scout was actually a T1 Academy. He had to play behind Faker, and he left because he realized there's no chance that I'm ever going to... I'm not going to be able to defeat this guy for his spot. He's too much of a legend. He's too good. I'm going to go to China, get paid, of course, but also go and win multiple championships, including a world championship for himself with EDG. This team is stacked. Both of these teams are stacked. They've swapped their junglers, so they should have each other completely downloaded. And I'm here for it. You know, I can't wait to see everything that goes that goes on with it. All right, so let's take a peek. We've got a minute 30 in. We look at delayed lane swaps, delayed invade. Uh, Nocturne's going to be the big benefactor here because Skarner is taking some amount of time. It looks like Renekton looked to try to harass him. This is a big step that we want to see from top laners. If you're going to go cross map, then you want to spend some amount of time harassing the enemy jungler uh, so that you can delay their start. The, the p team that benefits most from these sort of swaps and lane swaps is going to be farming junglers, which is exactly what Nocturne is, right? So Nocturne's going to be able to get free roam through his jungle, power clear, which is exactly what he wants to do. Doesn't need to worry about ganking. And we'll see how much they can get into into their defenses now rakan we've seen a couple times that supports will leech level two and then come and defend bot lane with a teleport from the top laner and most times these bot laners what you're going to notice is that they stacked the wave and they want to get this huge push coming through right this huge push the reason that it's important is because this cannon and all of these casters are now going to be the source of multiple plates worth of damage and the only way to really punish this play is to teleport bottom and say, okay, I will soak all of the experience. Now, at what point are you willing to come down? It looks like Weibo has come up with the adaptation that Nar, it can actually come down here because he's mega, right? And the fact that he's mega Nar means that he can pop down and defend this thing. And that's a little bit of an adaptation. We haven't seen a mega Nar transform into bot lane. That is the sort of thing that we love to see for adaptations. Games paused. Uh, I'm going to turn on the sound and see if we can figure out why. Alright, looks like they're back in game, so no big deal. So we're getting back into the action, right? This Meganar was able to take a lot. Now, the big question is, is anyone going to have access to all of this experience? And it looks like Nar calls it off, even though he might have been able to chase that kill, which the answer is probably not. He probably, probably can't. He is now the huge winner from this play. All right, Nocturne came down. He's got some action for himself. That's obviously going to be great. But Nar, who has the counter pick against the Ren Renekton, is now 101. And you have Renekton playing in a very weak lane phase. He is not really a strong champion to level three, especially into these ranged champions. So I love this adaptation from Weibo Gaming that they are sticking the Ash up in the top lane to fight against him. So let's see how this goes out. We've got the meta coming in. They did miss the cannon early, so that might be something that they wish that they had gotten. All right, they get Gala. Tarzan going for the re-engage. I love it, getting in there. You see how they drop that ward, by the way? This is super important in the middle of fights, dropping wards for visions, and then you saw the sweeping lens. So we saw adaptation to adaptation to adaptation, a very advanced uh, and metagamed bot lane uh, dive right there. So fantastic to see these guys playing at a high level. Now, Weibo, right, the big thing that you can't do in top lane, you can't turn that into turret plates. The defenses are too high. When you go for a lane swap, you have to go for an experience lead, right? You cannot get the gold lead when you're the team that puts two champions up in the top lane. So what they're going to try to do is sit on this Renekton and make it so that he cannot play the game. He's already died. He's already teleported. And now they're sitting here and they're camping his ability to get back into the game. So they are trying to shut out this Renekton. So even further now, the difference between Renekton and Nar is going to be that much bigger. 
right? Weibo has thrown this huge wrench into the game plan. Now it's five minutes into the game and you can start considering trying to play for that turret. Now that the fortifications are down, you can see way more action, way more plausibility to that play. But it looks like they've managed to get that wave to rebound as well, which means that they might now be able to stick Nar with his plated steel caps, with his level lead and gold lead, up into this Renekton in a wave that's coming back to him. So you have the perfect situation for counterpick. Now, if you're LNG... How do you adapt to this, right? This wave is going to be pushing out. You do have the support of the minions, but with that plated steel cap, you can basically ignore the damage that's going to be coming from the minions. And Nar is going to be big. Can Nocturne hit level six? One of the things that we're looking as a way to flesh out this play, and we see teams really script the first seven minutes of the game, right? They're, they really have a lot of game plans that are going in. They definitely have strategies, plan A, plan B, plan C, for each draft, what they want to do. You'll notice that the top side quadrant, the camps are all gone. This is vital, right? Because if you're going to spin back and you have Nocturne come back to his jungle, if he's able to clear those camps, we're talking about him getting level six right now. And instead, he doesn't. That's a huge difference when you're talking about the setup for this Nar. Now, Nar is taking a lot of damage here. This is kind of concerning to me. He tried to overfreeze rather than just play for the X for the XP lead, which means that he gets chunked and blown up. This is a huge mistake by Breathe. Good punish by LNG. They say, okay, you want to give up some of your prio to go and fight for Scuttle Crabs? That's fine, but you've taken way too much damage up in the top lane. Good punish, and that is... Breathe is going to consider that a blunder. No doubt about it. Teleport is back up. That can't be right. Check out that fight. Good position over committing. Based on the fact that Nar wasn't there, right? They didn't have the ability. Now, they may feel like they're good to continue, knowing that a lot of cooldowns have come down. But again, Nocturne's going to be a huge winner out of this. Uh, Jin holding steady. Nar, we see on the screen right now that Nar's teleport looks like it's up. But it couldn't have been up. He teleported to bot lane. So I don't know if that's a spectator bug based on when the game got paused. Now, another thing to worth considering, right? If you're the team fight team and you say that we can take all fights later in the game, void grubs are less important. You see Weibo going for this and getting punished. This is what Renekton wants. You kind of bailed him out where he's like, okay, my base level kit is going to do enough right now. And we have the support. Ari's absolutely huge right now. Nocturne's on his way to, to becoming big as well and being super sped up. So Weibo taking this fight is sort of against their narrative, right? You'd much rather be the team that starts to dragon stack and looks to just pluck one or two of those Void Grubs away, especially in that situation where you're telling, you're saying that Nar has Renekton checkmated. Uh, not anymore, right? It's like you went for a big combo play. I don't know what the result's going to be. And you end up risking everything to try to go for an extra piece. You end up giving stuff back. If you're new to the channel, I do like to use chess analogies a lot. Uh, we say that this game, if you look at season one and what the best teams were doing, we'll call that rated 2000. And in chess, rated 2000 for 100 years was like, that's insane. You are a grandmaster. You are one of the best players in the world. Well, that number goes up over time. Every time that someone plays a game, publishes a book, or, or just anything happens, the rest of the world can take that and learn from it. Now we're in this computer age where we can get some of the thinking done for us as well. But chess in particular, you think of what used to be 2000 rated being the best in the world. Now you're talking about 2800. Someone, you know, Magnus Carlsen even going for 2900. 2000 is just not that good. And it's the same thing with League of Legends. The strategies that were around in season one were bare bones. It was the lowest level of everything. You know, these sort of concepts have filtered their way all the way down to, to gold and silver games. What happens over time is you keep on seeing adaptations. What are lane swaps? How are we going to reflect to matchups? The players now are not playing at a just skill level. They're playing on a 
levels level where they're going to try to outthink their opponents. And that's what's exciting about the game now. There's still a lot of room. And, you know, FlyQuest is playing Giga Tempo, which we absolutely love. Team Liquid is the team that really started it in NA and said, hey, we're just going to play at this high level, try to get maximize all of the resources on the map. All right, this continuation seems really loose. You do have Rakan uh, Skarner, so Skarner's going to feel very tanky. But I think Skarner's going to want to look to get back and finish his heart steal because he almost definitely has it done right now. You might look to clear one more camp just to make sure that it's getting its reset. But if you can get that early heart steal, then you're talking about a lot of extra, a lot of extra prowess in the fights. Lens there, fight in two directions. Weibo decides to retreat to the right. They say, "Okay, you've consolidated on that side. That's good." Garner can not be slowed down while he starts that, so he fights for the team. Good instinct by Rakan. You also see the control word, so he had pretty good timing there. And this was this was a split call by LNG. You had some people on the cutoff, some people on the let me get the wave first or approach from this angle. And that leaves the way to F your way out, right? Not necessarily talking about flashing your way out. When there's two fights and you're being collapsed on, the best exit is to go through one. If you try to corral, you will eventually get surrounded. So the best way out is exactly what they did. Engage on two of them, take your quick 3v2, see if you can get a pick, and then you've got the safety of your turret. A, a little bit of a mistake for, from LNG, make, uh, not letting two of the carries get, get in position for the fight there. So that will springboard into extra, extra Void Grubs. The first row of Voids is finally cleared, and there's not going to be a second spawn because it's 11.50 in the game. So... Uh, there will not be a respawn here. We did see in the meantime, Nar did get that solo queue or that solo kill against Renekton. He is still pressing this lead. Uh, interestingly for Renekton, he's in a weird position where he wants Merc Treads this game, but he can't afford to buy Merc Treads. Sometimes in this spot, you might see the Swifties being purchased where it still has some effect against the Nar, the slows from Skarner, Oriana, literally everyone on their team has an effect that's going to slow you. So having Swifties would help you with that. It also gives you extra backline access, and it allows you to play a little bit more modal, uh, dodge more boomerangs from Nar. The problem is that it doesn't give you the stats that you need, and Nar can just still poke you out. So we'll see if he ends up going for that later. We imagine it's going to be Merc Treads because he's going to try to get onto that backline. So that leaves them with essentially a stride breaker start. And that means that you have pretty weak items. Basically, until you get to the stride breaker, the NAR is going to bully you out. And even when you do have it, it's going to be dash and stride breaker. Try to use the gap close uh, to get to him. NAR will always be able to buy the space. And that's without even considering how big of a lead that they gave him for this game. Weibo is going to be super happy, right? They had that one mess up in front of the in front of the void pit. They shouldn't have gone for that fight, but everything else has been going fantastically for them. They will undoubtedly outscale this game. Uh, Nocturne has not been able to make the huge play that you're looking for. See Stridebreaker already picked up for him as well, so he's looking to make sure that that first gank is effective. Jin and Rel being rotated over to the top lane. Now we've seen some adaptations. We haven't talked on this channel much about the 14 minute rotations and what teams are expecting so here we go slow you got the Q. we just rush the flash doesn't even let him get the stride breaker out and it looked like he didn't even get a red attack on or did he he's able to get that slow and then get the stride breaker into range he might have been okay that's nocturne all down now and you and you blew that right before Jin was in range so Perhaps a little hasty from Weiwei. Good job by Nar pushing that limit. That means that you can send Oriana down to the bot wave. She has teleport available. She can just pick this up. The Renekton is not a threat. Uh, and you look that she has rushed for the Seraph's Embrace this game. So she, th this is something we absolutely love. You want to get this. When when you play a champion that has a shield, this it's basically true for every champion with a shield. It is more important to stack AP than some of the other passive effects because that shield doesn't get bigger without that, right? And it's only the AP. It doesn't matter if you have Spell Pen. It doesn't matter if you have an on-hit effect like Luden's Companion. You want maximum level of AP from this. So you see that he's gotten Lucid Boots, and he's going for that Archangel Staff. 
which means that we might see, I mean, almost definitely by third item at Rabidons. Uh, I'm curious what's going to be second, if it's going to be Zonia's to try to survive the dive that's coming in. Uh, and it, if that's the case and you have very defensive itemization from Orianna, you're just going to play this slow and steady game where Nar can push the side lanes. You've got the catch potential from Skarner and Ash. I really like how Weibo is setting, the, setting themselves up for this game. Now, all of their vision is being used. You can see this line of scrimmage being drawn here, right? They're just saying, this is our area. And they're even going for a little bit right here. And this little bit says, hey, we're we're willing to take these fights. Now, as the scaling team, you want to make sure that you're fighting on breakpoints, right? And, and it has to be the breakpoints that you want, that you choose. You have to be really careful right now. You're not that much bigger. Even though Nar is much bigger than Renekton, Renekton has shopped. So let's take a look how this plays out. Looks like they, LNG decides to call this off, give up a dragon. That's two dragons now in the pocket of the scaling team. I am struggling to find a way for LNG to win. What's their win condition? What do you guys think LNG should do as a win? Like, you have Nocturne that's supposed to have this big setup potential, but he doesn't have his ultimate for the, for the fight. And now that they do have it, and they had the item spikes, they actually had the best position that they've had relative to their opponents for the whole game. Right, you're an earlier spiking team. All of your champions had finished their first item. Uh, I'm surprised that they did not go for pulling the trigger there. Very focused damage on LNG. That's why the Weibo game plan, I think, was so well thought. So I guess if I'm LNG now, the one thing I'm looking for is how do I set up a pick? Right, how do I set up? What are the rotations? that I can try to exploit. A lot of this will come down to your advanced scouting. How much do you know about this team and their tendencies? Where do they like to ward? Where do they like to play as far as mid inside out prio? Or do they tend to go top into mid? Uh, do they, 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 they like to go split side for a long amount of time? How far does the split pusher like to go before he calls in his teleport? Things like this can be very important pieces of, of information that allow you to come up with a good game plan. So here's what we're talking about right now with the Skarner. Skarner into Ari can basically just ignore all of the damage. He can just walk up and get in her face and not really care. And he just ate all of her spells and only took a tenth of his HP bar. And with this Merc Treads, and then later in the game when you start talking about the Rakan shield, the Orianna shield, and remember we talked early on about Orianna spiking AP and how this team would be a shield bash team with multiple sources of shields to protect the, the Skarner. He just gets Merc Treads and stands there. That Orianna build that we talked about where you're going to try to max out the AP and just go for your gradual sustained damage, probably going to be a Leandri's next uh, with the Seraphs and then Rabidons to, to round it out. Maybe, maybe Zonia's and then Rabidons. That build allows you to just walk up as Skarner and go up with impunity and your team can start taking more and more space. And because everyone has a little bit of defensive itemization everyone no one's really care and no one's really scared of being the one who gets picked out so who do you search for this that basically leaves ash right now is the only target rakan because he's squishy enough could be the next one although we're gonna have presumably zeke's coming out from him and once he gets that they're super comfortable to take any fight it's like okay you want to come on to us we'll take this they are just taking a page out of the fly quest pay playbook i mean everyone has it but this is exactly how fly beat team liquid they say okay you want to try to come in you want to try to come to us fine i'll pick skarner i'll build shields i'll keep him alive good luck ever trying to get through the wall of ishtar nar's gonna start piling onto this lead with proxies a small little thing that I don't like here, Skarner just picked up that red buff. I wonder if that means that nerves are are going to play a part of this. Maybe they thought that they were losing some amount of the top of the southern quadrant presence, and he thought, this is my only chance to get this now. It might get a little bit dangerous. You can see the lines of wards, right, that Weibo has said, look, this is our area. We're going to try to make the play in this quadrant. Or this dragon this is where you're going to try to go if you're weibo you say okay you can have it we'll take this and we'll go and continue the game from here uh and 
And if you're LNG, like, what are you supposed to do? Are you going to force a fight into them? It's going to be really, really difficult. But this area is the only real win condition I see for LNG. They're going to take over this spot, uh, try to bait this fight. And again, if I'm Weibo, I just say, no, nope. I call your bluff and, and I'm going to re-raise you a Baron. You guys can have your first dragon of the game. We'll take Baron. Thank you. All right, we're post 20 minutes. So this is what I was expecting was this red buff. You normally want this to go after 20 minutes because the having it on everyone on your team definitely makes a difference in these fights. It's a small thing, but the regen, the extra slows on your attacks, all of that adds up. All right, so you see their plan, right? We're going to call this a lollipop strat where you're just like, hey, look, want a lollipop? Uh, basically, you're going to have this area. You have a team support. I'm just going to draw it on screen. Skarner controls an area, and everyone over here has to wonder whether or not they want the lollipop. And Ash is just going to be holding it out. It's like, ah, oh, you want it? You want it? If they try to come to the Skarner, Skarner says, yoink, I grab you and I bring you back, and we have our Ash or Yana combo or, or Nar, whatever it's going to be, to try to pull you into a fight. So you're going to see Skarner take more and more aggressive positions, trying to bait the enemy team to go onto them. If you're Nocturne, you have to find a way to target here. You have to find a way to get to the Ash. Uh, Ash does have cleanse for the fear. You do have slow as a follow-up, so it's important to get a slow out onto the Nocturne uh, and then get your cleanse. Make sure that you're able to kite back. He does have the Stride Breaker, uh, and you're probably going to see something like Steric's Gage coming to make him more of that bruiser build so that he can survive long enough, right? This team clearly just wants you to come to them and then swallow you up. So if you have a Steric Gage Stride Breaker build, maybe you stay alive a little bit longer. Uh, I do think it means that Ash is never going to die. I don't think Ash is going to die again this game. And Weibo looks like heavy favorites. We'll see. See what we get though. All right, control points marked, right? You see, fight for this area. If you control this triangle, this is the Bermuda Triangle. Blue team can defend. Red team can do it on the opposite side. But by controlling this this pit and this area, you say, I control all of the avenues here. If you want to fight us, you have to come around this super long way. And it becomes very predictable, very easy to defend. Skarner holds enough territory. And eventually they say, hey, we got our spot. Nar going forward. Plasco and all right, Nar's going to find him here. Ooh, he doesn't go for the throw first. All right, carefully don't get too spread out, guys. You might have a re-engage here from the Nocturne because Skarner did stay back on the Dragon. They may have vision of this. So Weibo may have had split calls here. And uh, you know how we feel about split calls. Doesn't matter how team, how strong your team is. Fighting with a finger, never good enough. You want to fight with a fist. Five people on the same call, always, always going to be a stronger, stronger call. Skarner using the W for slow. Flash forward to get the ultimate. And we get that situation we talked about. Here's the lollipop. Renekton's diving onto the Ash. Everything's going to be done to try to get this Renekton. But Renekton finds that kill with the Sterex Gage. Weibo biting off more than they can chew. And this was the scouting report. We talk about the importance of an advanced scout and having a game plan. Weibo, notorious. Notorious for overfighting and taking every fight always. And I think they're... they're theory is the more practice we get at it the better we'll get at it and by the end of the year when it matters most we will outplay our, our opponents but it showed its ugly head right here where they just over chased skarner stayed on the objective we had one here two here one here one here five people all in different positions in the quadrant is a really awkward position to be in so lng has a chance I'm still putting the game in, in Weibo's pockets if they play perfectly from here on out. So we were good, right? This is good. You're done. Boom. Right there after the flash. You can hop over one more, but Ash needs to start moving forward. Why? You can never go in a position where Ash says, okay, I've got the wave. You can't do it. If your team's calling to finish the fight, then you have to go and support the end of that fight because you don't know when that turnaround's going to come and you might need to participate. Not only that, but with Nocturne's ultimate being a lot up, Ash actually walked herself into a position uh, position where she could get gapped by, by the Nocturne, where you might give them an outlet, not just to escape the gank, but also to take you down. So really, uh, you know, I'm worried about that shot calling from Weibo. Uh, they're going to need to do it better. They still have the outscaling. They can still do the same plan that they had. They just need to do it a little bit better. Alright, Rakan does go lock it. 
Uh, I do like the locket as another way to keep people alive just a little bit longer. An extra shield for the Skarner. Here we go. Oh, big mistake again from Ash. Ash kiting away from the enemies rather than towards your team means that Zhao Hu was not able to get the big shield on top of him in time. You need to reposition. This is a couple of big mistakes now from Light. And LNG's punishing, and they have been the supreme team fighting team in the region. Things are very, very interesting in this game now. I I am worried for light. So one of the things that we talk about on this team is is mentality, psyche, like what, what goes on. It's very hard to create the stress and the pressure of what happens on this stage. Watch this fight, all right? Blue team, importantly, has vision control in this. That's a very important element. Now, right here, if you go, this is a huge mistake. The tendency is to run this way. You cannot do it. You have to go this way. You have to go towards where your team can help you. Ash actually volunteers herself into an isolated position, which makes her a sitting duck for the RE. Uh, that is... I mean, I, I will say team fighting 101 for an AD carry. If you follow the channel, you know that that's what we talk about all the time with AD carries. Go towards your help, not away from the threat. If you go away from the threat, they can still hunt you down. They have all the resources. This is not the same game it was in season two, where you're just going to carry the game by taking one-on-one -on -one fights on repeat. They are too good. The people are going to gap close. They're going to have the tools to kill you. The bruisers deal too much damage. It's not it's not your old like Malphite with no ultimate trying to chase you down, right? All these guys have damage. Get behind your teammates. Find a way to reposition. Get that lollipop formation back into into fine. Alright, three dragons to zero. Uh the same available play is there for Weibo. You can see that LNG thinks that they're going to fight for this, and you can see matching wards here. On this on this quadrant but honestly this should not matter it is just the baron that is of importance right now and everything should be done to fight for mid lane prio and then use it to get to the sides and as long as you can control that bracket of mid lane and marginalize mid lane then you can have an advantage when it comes to making that call lng wants to get a pick best case scenario for them is that they bluff dragon they invite enemy team to come to them and then they go for a pick but anytime that you position on the right side of the map, it means that you're going to get skewered on the left. And that's exactly what's happening here. They've volunteered themselves for this dragon. This is the wrong call, LNG. Huge mistake. Uh, there's no counterplay now. They're just going to give this up. Maybe they think they can take a fight. But no, no, don't run. Don't run. Ash, again, you're away from your team. You need to hold your position. I'm going to tear my hair out by the end of this game because light. We got to work on this, my man. All right, they get out with it. They've got Baron. Now, this is checkmate again. You have the Baron buff with the team fight team. You can just invite the other team to come to you, uh, see what they have in response. There's really no good game plan. Now, we have seen... Wait, hold on. Wait, but Tarzan, what are you doing? There's no reason to come check to look at this dragon. All you care about is defending this line of scrimmage and going up for the push right here. Get Oriana back to this side. Now, it looks like she's trying to leave and she does not have teleport. So she's calling everyone off right now. Uh, might make sense. They just got the Baron. They also picked up the tier two in the top lane. They didn't get this one though. This is a big target. I much rather would have seen them go and extend the play Hold this line and say, I dare you to come back and defend from the dragon pit. The only reasonable approach would be for them to recall and come back, which would be too slow. Uh, or you're saying, hey, we don't want to give you any openings. We don't want to, you know, we didn't dot our I's and cross all of our T's right now. We're kind of rushed. We snuck this Baron. We weren't expecting it. We don't want to give you any openings. That makes sense, too. All right, there we go. This, the Seekers we were talking about. So it is going to be Zonia's. So this Oriana, not dying. We have Phantom Dancer and Bloodthirster on the Ash. Maybe not dying, although Ash has been walking themselves into some difficult positions. Nar is on full-on carry mode. Multiple tenacity. 
items to to go with the with the level lead that he's got level 16 he's going to rage out and he's just going to be able to carry these fights i think what we're going to see from weibo is to try to go with lateral pushes here and try to get this one done as well no they're not doing it skarner is just waiting to flank against the engage saying okay that's your angle if you want to try to move up on us so they're taking it one step at a time saying hey you have a nocturne we'd rather not risk anything careful breathe don't do it do not do it this is x don't go there you've got your position if nothing happens you win the game okay that's what your call is we're winning we're winning by more we're taking things there's nothing that we need to do here we don't need to force anything the barons are going to take care of the structures and who's going to clear waves right ari with a little bit of true damage Jin, not enough not enough damage to go all right here's the fight they're saying this is our chance They've committed everything to that they will commit to try to get this inhibitor. We've got some Sterics gauge popping. Turn out the lights, see if we can get some misinformation, but it's a little bit too little, too late. I like this moment for LNG, right? You've basically picked the last possible time to engage. You've waited the most. You've tried to chip as much as you could. The only slightly better time would be right as the turret's going down. Uh, where you can maybe pressure them into into a bad choice. Uh, Weibo played a fantastic game. Light did not. So if I'm coaching, we're going to talk about his pressure, his nerves. It's okay. Shake it off. Uh, we've got another game ahead of us. We need the best version of you. You got this. We can still do this. And that's what I'm trying to portray. Uh, keep cool and, and calm because you played a great game. So keep them in their strategical mind. Try to help Light out with the nerves.